Welcome back to Family Health Today. I'm Dr. Jeanette Neshwat. It's not hard to underestimate the current danger posed by childhood obesity. As we said earlier in the show, today's generation of children is the first in modern history to be given a shorter life expectancy than their parents. There are so many factors involved, from working parents feeding children more fast food to sedentary lifestyles and video games. Well, joining us now to discuss child obesity and what parents and children need to do to fight it is pediatrician Dr. Mark Lovell. Welcome to the show, Dr. Hi. Lovell. Appreciate you being here. Glad to be here. You know, we're seeing more and more children with high blood pressure and high cholesterol and diabetes. It's just a growing problem. First, just tell us, what is diabetes to start off with? Well, traditionally in the old days, we would think about diabetes as, as juvenile onset and adult onset. And one of the things that's really changed is that those distinctions have blurred. Mm -hmm. And so now we talk about diabetes in, in the terms of type 1 diabetes and type 2 diabetes. Type 1 diabetes basically is what we tend to still see more in children where the pancreas probably from multiple reasons, there's some genetic mm -hmm. factors, but primarily probably some environmental factors that attack the pancreas and the pancreas just quits making insulin, and those kids then get rapidly sick. Adult onset, or type 2 diabetes, uh, has traditionally been thought to not be something that we see in kids, and that the pancreas just gradually wears out, or the, the individual who develops type 2 diabetes develops some resistance to insulin, and their, their sugars gradually grow. As we've seen kids and adolescents, especially adolescents, uh, become more and more uh, obese, we've seen that age group drop from adults to occasionally seeing uh, children and starting to in larger centers see uh, fairly frequently uh, young, young adults with uh, type 2 diabetes. Yeah. Who, who's at risk for diabetes? Well, the, the, the risk factors are different for type 1 and type 2. Mm -hmm. And so since type 2 is more of a lifestyle uh, mm -hmm. uh, illness, uh, let's talk about the risk factors for that. First of all, genetics plays a role. If you have one parent who has uh, type 2 diabetes mm -hmm. before age 50, you have about a 1 in 13 chance as, that, uh, as the child of that parent to have diabetes. If you have... Um, two parents with diabetes, you have a one in two chance. Wow. So there's, a, there's definitely some genetics that's involved. Uh, lifestyle choices are involved. We know that people who develop type two diabetes, both children and adults, uh, have certain characteristics. They oftentimes are, are overweight. Uh, they oftentimes are very sedentary and they eat diets that may be high in uh, either uh, fats or, uh, or, or small chain, yeah. small carbohydrates mm -hmm. as opposed to larger carbohydrates like we'd find in grains right. and cereals and those kinds of things. Sure. And how do you diagnose diabetes? There really are about three things that doctors look at mm -hmm. for diabetes. First of all, uh, just from a symptomatology, what might bring a patient to see us is that they find that they're drinking more, they're, 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 they're urinating more, mm -hmm. they're more tired. Uh, they may or may not have actually lost some weight. Uh, older adults oftentimes will have sores that don't heal. And then the diagnosis is made by laboratory workup. Uh, probably the easiest laboratory workup is a fasting mm -hmm. blood sugar uh, so that you don't have anything to eat for about 8 to 12 hours. We check your blood sugar. Currently, the American Diabetic Association mm -hmm. would say if your blood sugar is, fasting blood sugar is over 126, then you would be diagnosed as someone who has diabetes. If your blood sugar was between 100 and 126, there's a term they now use called prediabetes, mm -hmm. and normal would be less than 100. Yeah. The second thing that people look at is a, is a blood test that looks at blood sugar over the last three to four months called the hemoglobin A1C. And the third thing that helps more in adults than children is a glucose, a two-hour glucose tolerance test. Sure. Now, are you seeing a lot more children coming into your clinic with diabetes or diabetic symptoms? In our clinic, I would say still, we're not at the point. We still see fairly young kids. And, and I think that probably it's more the young adolescent, the 13, 14, 17 year old that's showing up with, with type two diabetes that would be taken care of generally in a tertiary care setting at, at Arkansas mm -hmm. Children's Hospital. We would still deal mostly in the pediatric office with type one diabetes, which really lifestyle changes don't mm -hmm. make a whole lot of difference. Right. 
What's very worrisome for us is that we're starting to see little guys who are really overweight sure. and they may have some pre-diabetic changes like some darkening of the skin in their neck or, or underneath their arm that we call acanthosis nigrans. And we worry that those kids, unless we make some, help them make some changes, are going to progress to those adolescents that then have type 2 sure. diabetes. And have you actually had to start children on insulin, for example, or do you start them on... PO medications yeah. first. Most of what we take care of, again, and, and in yeah, my practice have, right now, yeah. we have no type 2 diabetes None. in our young kids, only type 1, which would be treated with insulin. And it, from your experience, do you know that, if, for example, down in UAMS at Children's, do they, have they ever started uh, some children on, like metformin, which yeah. is used for adults, or sure. do you know if that's contraindicated? At Arkansas Children's yeah. Hospital, in, in larger hospital yeah. settings where yeah. they're going to see patients sure, that would be sure. transferred in from all over the state, they will have they some will children who are type 2 yeah. diabetics. And so not only would they make lifestyle right. changes, but maybe be able to use some oral medicines that might uh, alleviate yeah. some of their diabetic symptoms. Uh, kids, kids that develop type 2 diabetes oftentimes also are a little different in adults that they progress a little bit to the need of insulin a little bit faster, even our type oh, really? 2 diabetics. Okay. What would you say are good, some good prevention steps to take, Dr. Lovell? Yeah. If I could talk to parents about anything, yeah. it would be to start early because what we know is that prevention mm -hmm. is a lot easier to do than treatment for obesity. Mm -hmm. So the first thing a parent can do is, even while your baby's inside mm -hmm. your womb, is to eat a variety eat of food. There are some studies that would actually say that if you eat certain types of foods, broccoli, et cetera, mm -hmm. and you develop those tastes that the baby even experiences that inside the womb wow. and may develop those tastes afterwards. We know that, that mothers who exercise mm -hmm. and don't develop gestational diabetes, who have normal weighted babies, tend to have babies who are less likely to be obese. The second thing after your baby's born, if you can give your baby the gift of breastfeeding them for the first year of life, all the evidence points to the fact that those kids are going to be at less risk for obesity as children and adults. The third thing that we try to convince, and there's just been recently a study I, I, I read that said for our formula-fed babies that if we can convince people to start uh, solids at six months as opposed mm -hmm. to earlier, that those kids will have a, about a 40% reduction in obesity if they start solids later mm -hmm. Uh, at three years of age. Why is that? Uh, I don't think anybody completely understands. Knows? Some of that may be uh, one of the things that happens with families mm -hmm. is that food sometimes becomes a thing that's pacification as opposed to nutrition. Mm -hmm. And so when you got your little gotcha. two month old and you give them the cereal and they seem to smile and enjoy that, sometimes it's hard to then not mm -hmm. to have a mindset. Right. So one of the things that we're trying to do is we treat teach people about early infant nutrition mm -hmm. is to say, we want to teach you a mindset that's healthy so that it starts from the time the baby's born and then that develops into prevention. Right. Okay. Third thing, a second thing that you can do is to live a healthy lifestyle yourself. Uh, there, we've talked about the fact that genetics predisposes uh, people to mm -hmm. diabetes. But we also know from studies that if parents are overweight or parents are inactive, that kids tend to do that and so kids tend to follow that. Yeah. So, you know, and, and it puts a lot of, I don't want to put a lot of pressure on moms, but I'm going to put a lot of pressure on moms. Uh, the studies even say that overweight, inactive moms mm -hmm. Uh, set the tone more for their family than, over, than us overweight and active fathers, okay? Yeah. So, so live a healthy lifestyle. The third thing is, is to try to teach your kids uh, with actions and not words. So your kiddos don't have the ability to turn on the car and drive and get a soda pop or an ice cream or to drive to a place to, that can get the foods that may not be healthy mm -hmm. for them. So you as a parent have to, to kind of adapt the, right. the model that says, look, yeah. I recognize that Sally or Sam really tends to be a child who wants to eat sweets and overeat. We're just not going to have those in the house. Fourthly, if you can be an active family. So activity doesn't always have to be soccer or football or baseball where, where some kids don't excel. Mm -hmm. But it does a lot of times have to be w taking walks as a family, going for hikes, uh, getting a mm -hmm. GPS uh, thing and, and doing geocaching mm -hmm. or working yeah. out in the garden so that you develop an active lifestyle that may live on with that child uh, for their, for their right. whole lifetime. Right, especially since they're a product of their environment and, and their upbringing. That's correct. Sure, sure. So those are just some ideas that Very I would good. share with people if you said, what could I do to, to, to diabetic-proof right. my, my child? It would be to try to make those changes in your family. Mm -hmm. And if you can make those habit changes, 
then a lot of the things that you deal with later on are going to take care of themselves. Absolutely. Excellent tips. <clears throat> Tell us about the ICANN program. Yeah. In 2003, uh, the state of Arkansas did a really incredible thing. Mm -hmm. They passed a, a piece of legislation that made some requirements to the schools. And they said to schools, look, we're going to require that you increase your physical education uh, and made a requirement that you had to have 150 hours mm -hmm. or 150 minutes per week of, of physical education for each child. They did some recommendations about involvement of the community. They did some recommendations or some requirements uh, about uh, changing some nutritional standards in the mm -hmm. uh, cafeteria. And so all of those things came on board and there were no programs the legislation was made. There was no programs to implement all of the changes. And so I had a friend named Brett Stone, who at that time was a PE teacher at Elkins. And he said, Dr. Lovell, I said, you can call me Mark. He says, Mark, what can we do? Can we write a nutrition physical education curriculum? And out of that came ICANN. And what we determined was that we, as we looked at overweight kids and we tried to provide help for them and provide mm -hmm. Uh, a prevention program that really kids needed to have three three folks help them. And uh, it, so we kind of pictured a three leg stool. So if you had a stool and it had three legs, one leg was the school, one leg was their parents, and the other leg was them. And, and so we attempted with ICANN to involve all of those groups and to empower the child to make changes mm -hmm. and to make good choices. And so out of that came a nine week program where we would teach nutrition and health and physical education and provide that 150 minutes for our kids in those schools. Uh, we would have a weekly meeting with parents. That they would come and we would have a dietitian that talked to them. We would provide a healthy meal for them. And while we talked to the parents about nutritional topics, uh, the kids would go with the PE teacher and would have a 30 minute PE uh, activity. Then they would all come back and they would have a family meal uh, that had healthy choices, uh, uh, you know, in appropriate amounts. Absolutely. And we did that for nine weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, we were fortunate enough to get some grants, two grants mm -hmm. from the Blue and You Foundation. We were able to establish the program initially in Elkins and then in the, wow. in the schools of the Boston Mountain Co-op. I won't list all of them, but they were great partners for us. And we saw some, some great things come out of that. And, and I think that's a, it, it's a great program. It was a program that as I went to different places and went to different conferences, I can met every requirement of a successful uh, uh, adventure. Now, the, the problem is, is that over the last few years, one of the things that's happened is the state has backed off a little bit on those requirements. Mm -hmm. About two, year olds, two years ago, they decreased the requirements for physical education to about 50 minutes a week. And there's rumbling that some of that's going to even be cut back more. Mm -hmm. We were at one point, as the state of Arkansas, a, an example that when I would go to meetings as in, a, in as diverse mm -hmm. places as uh, San Francisco, Brisbane, Australia, people knew about Arkansas and Act 1220. And uh, I would encourage people to talk to their superintendents. Mm -hmm. I would encourage people to talk to their senators and state representatives and the governor and say, hey, look, we want to move Arkansas back to a place where it was with Act 1220 in, in its original form that really made us a shining star uh, that no other state had. Uh, and it, it's an incredible story, and, and it's great to see Arkansas be in the lead of something. Absolutely fantastic. Dr. Lovell, where can our viewers and parents go to get more information about the ICANN program and healthy lifestyle tips? You know, one of the things that, that if they, if a parents would be interested, they, they're more than happy to call our clinic. Okay. Uh, I'm at the Children's Clinic at Harbor uh, Meadows. Uh, okay. We're happy to, to have them call us there. Currently, we don't have the program in any schools. Mm -hmm. If schools are interested in that, if they would call or contact me there, uh, we would be happy to work with them to see if there's something that we could do that would meet the needs that they would have at their schools too. Very good. And then they can also go to mypyramid.gov for more information. Yeah. Now, there's some great information mm -hmm. uh, to for, for parents at home to look at. One is www.mypyramid.gov. A lot of times folks don't know what good nutrition is. It's a great website to give them great Very information. Good. Well, Dr. Lovell, thank you so much for joining us here today. We appreciate everything you do for us here in our community and for our children especially. Thank you. All right. Stay tuned. Family Health Today will return in just a moment.